Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And part of a sacred place called Ark Walks Anonymous, thank you for the invitation and congratulations to the celebrants. Uh, if anyone's new, I know there's a few newbies here. Uh, the anniversaries are really what I've been taught. It's not about me uh, when I'm celebrating, but it's just testimony to uh, what God does and Alcoholics Anonymous does for us. Um, after a while, I've learned to pay uh, some attention to the words people speak, but a lot more attention to the power that God does uh, in our life. And uh, before I get going, I just got to uh, say hello to uh, some old friends. We got Ron out here from California and Miss Liz and Miss Donna, who I know seems like forever. My God. And it's really good to see you, you folks out here. Uh, some friendly faces. Uh, June 23rd, 1988 is when God separated me from alcohol. Very grateful for this gift of sobriety. Very grateful to be a member of Good Standing and Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a sponsor out of Minnesota. His name is Bob Bazans, and my home group is Alcoholics and God in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which I, I just moved up here. I originally uh, got down here, moved to Boca Raton, which was a blast. But um, I think you get older and wiser and, and find the place that works for me. And I, I really like Fort Lauderdale. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool town. And home group is great. It's about not even a 10-minute drive, so I really appreciate that. So it, it's all good. Um, I, I'm, I'm on a short leash this morning, uh, 35 minutes. And so uh, just to qualify, uh, to let you know I belong here and, and see what God gives me uh, for a topic, I, I, I will tell you uh, uh, June is an AA birthday, God willing, and um, it just seems to sneak up on me this time of year, um, especially as a Catholic with the, the holiday, the importance of a holiday I celebrate this time of year. It's, it's a lot of time for reflection and uh, where we've been and um, where I am. And the, 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 the rebirth we all get to experience, the resurrection we get to experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. I usually refer to AA as the sacred rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because so we see lives get reborn and resurrected in here for fun and for free. You don't need to be a certain color, political party, have a point of view. Um, we just seem to destroy our lives. We come in here and we get a standing ovation. It makes no sense. Um, but uh, we come in here, bust it up. We used to call it tore up from the floor up. And um, it's a place where um, we identify with each other in our brokenness. When we tell stories of what it was like, what happened and what it's like now, the what it was like. As a new guy, when I was here, I locked into that. And I wanted to know how you got the what happened and how you are where you are now. Uh, I was hungry for that. And the gift of desperation met me on June 23rd, 1988. And uh, that, that uh, it's not the same desperation as I had in June in 88. But the hunger uh, to, to awaken, to know my God, to be of service, has certainly increased over the years. It's, it's, it's what I am, and God has given me a servant's heart. If something happened to me in June of 88 where for a brief moment, you know, I think we all get it, it's where the uh, desperation screams a little louder than the ego. And at that point, we're kind of opened up, and there's a bit of a vacuum, if you will, uh, to get a visual on this, and uh, God's light gets in. And we can be forever changed. We don't. I don't ever have to hit a bottom like that again. I'll be it. There's some bottoms we'll get in AA, but not like that. And uh, Richard Raw, the author, calls it uh, falling up at this point, and we get surrendered. And I couldn't orchestrate that on my best day, but that's what happened to me in June of '88. Uh, I had been through six treatment centers by 1988, about to go into my seventh, and uh, this time. In 1980, this time of year, I, I was a full-fledged homeless guy. 
um, not knowing uh, how I was going to get the next buck other than stealing and panhandling to get a drink in me. Because by this time in my life, um, the narcotics were out of my life, but the drinking and eat, I was taking Valium, I couldn't get I couldn't get away from. And it wasn't about, uh, I think I'll drink today. I had to drink just to stop my body from vibrating and getting sick. And uh, I didn't know about it then, but I do know now I was going through withdrawal all the time. I was cold, sweating, shaking, uh, and in serious trouble. And um, I, I landed in uh, this abandoned building, and I took up residency there because I was too weak and feeble to defend myself. I got arrested a bunch of times, and I knew if I got arrested again, I was going to go to prison this time. Uh, I wasn't a violent drunk. I wasn't a, a guy running around with, with weapons. But, uh, you know, you get arrested enough, and you appear in front of a judge. At some point, they put you away. And I would hide out. Uh, 1988, getting into treatment, uh, I weighed about a, a buck thirty, um, running around with hepatitis C and urinating blood. I, I mean, I'm I'm in serious trouble at this point, and I would still figure, in my mind would still say, if we get a drink in us, we'll figure out how to change our life. Uh, I never saw drinking as the symptom. I saw it as the problem. And if I can have a drink to figure out how not to drink, I'm going to be okay. And what I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous is that my alcoholism doesn't come in a bottle of whiskey. Because when I sobered up in 1988, uh, thank you, God, I ran into me sober. And that was not a good day because I was still suffering from alcoholism. It's kind of like if you go grocery shopping, and you put all your grocery bags on the front seat and you're kind of coasting along and you come to red light <clears throat> and hit the brakes, the car stops and the groceries keep going. And when I got here and God pulled the plug on drinking, alcoholism was in still forward momentum. And it was doing my thinking for me, my seeing for me, my hearing for me, everything for me. And I was operating purely out of this predator called the mind. Now, if you're new, you might hear things like uh, bring the body and the mind will follow. Lose that uh, because it's deadly. The last thing any of us need, starting with me, is my mind to show up at any time, any day, at any moment. It is the troublemaker. Now, if that works for you, I'm not here to change you. I don't want to be controversial. I'm just here to share with you what works. My alcoholism gets to life by devouring mine. That's what it does. It feeds off me. So uh, I, I picked up a drink at uh, 14 years old uh, on a street corner in Brooklyn, New York. You can tell, by the way, I speak. I'm not from Oklahoma. Um, but uh, Brooklyn, New York, we, you know, that's what we did. We hung out on street corners and schoolyards. And uh, the older guys, they were men, worldly men. They were 17 and 18. Uh, they hung out with the ladies in the summertime when school was out. The corners were packed. They were drinking and listening to music. It was the uh, late 60s. Um, a lot of problems uh, out there in the world in the 60s. Uh, but I've shared this from a million ponies. There was something that was, there was a threat of okayness going on. And quite frankly, it was music. Uh, we had the, 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 the luxury of listening to Motown music and rock and roll at its best. And uh, I remember the guys would bring out the little transistor radios, drink cold 45 beer, and the guys and girls were flirting roughhouse, and everyone was having a good time, and I wanted to get in the middle of it. And there was a pecking order. You had to work your way up to the older guys and uh, show you were worth it. And I, I, that was my, my goal. Uh, at 14 years old, I, I get my first uh, cold 45 beer in me, and halfway through a quart of beer, uh, I'm feeling something I never experienced before. Um, I wasn't about God back then. About six months earlier, my mom committed suicide, and I, I kind of wasn't a conscious decision, but uh, this God I was brought up with, I wasn't thinking about him anymore. I looked at God as cruel and unjust, unfair, and um, I want no part of it. Now, I was never an atheist, but uh, God and I kind of parted ways. And um, as a little guy uh, around ages 8 to 10, I, I had someone, um, I'll call it this way, sexually violating me uh, for about two years, and I didn't know what to do with that. So by the time I show up to a street corner at 14 years old, I'm ready for a drink. I need a drink. I don't know it. 
I blame none of that on my alcoholism. It's just trauma. It's part of the the potpourri of makes me or made me who I was. And it was a lot of healing that went on in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, over the years, you know, I'll, uh, from time to time, I've experienced I've experienced guilt and shame and fear and rejection that would enslave me. But I'm happy to report to you that God always frees me of that stuff. Um, but at 14, I pick up this quarter of cold 45 beer. And by the time I finish it, I'm drunk. And I know drunk for the first time. I can feel drunk and I love it. I'm numb. Nothing's getting in and only out what I want. And um, at that moment, I realized uh, how much bondage I had been in until I tasted a little bit of freedom. That'll walk me right into Alcoholics Anonymous, by the way. And I love the effect produced by it. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous at 28 years old, about, I don't know, 14, 15 years later, I was that same kid who showed up, showed up to a street corner at 14 years old. I just wasn't drinking. And I'm doing two and three meetings a day after my seven treatment center. And the meetings gave me relief, but I wasn't free yet because I was still following me around. And I needed space between me and me, me and the self, me and my mind. I don't know how to do this. And so I'm going from meeting to meeting to meeting. I'm getting relief for an hour, and then sometimes I'm a little shaky in a meeting. The meeting would end. I'd hit the fresh air. Now what do I do? It's on me again. And it wasn't always drinking. It was a lot of thinking, a lot of trying to figure out my life and balance my life and all of this stuff, and it all operates out of the mind, and that's no good. And immediately I'm in bondage of self and attached to everything outside of me. If I can find a pretty girl to go out with, if I can get a good job that pays me money, if I can have a little AA car like the rest of those folks do, I'll be okay. And I get those things, I'm still not okay. I got my first AA car in recovery. You guys can identify with this. It went zero to 60 in two weeks. Um, I had one of those. Um, None of that worked. And in, in, in December of 1988, I bottomed out again, making meetings, sober. And I was getting thirsty. And I was living in Minnesota at the time. And once again, I made a plea to God to please help me. I don't know what to do. I'm going to these meetings and I, I'm thirsty. And I remember thinking, if I don't go to a bar or liquor store, I'm going to just pick something up. I got I to gotta get this thing off of me. It's squeezing me. And I went to some gentleman's house that I had met in AA. He was a real good guy. And I showed up at his doorstep unannounced, and he invited me in, and I told him my tales of woe. And when I slowed down enough to take a breath, he says, let me ask you a question. Where are you with God and the steps? I said, well, when do you start the steps? And he said, when you stop throwing up, you're kind of late. Now, that disturbed me. I didn't want to hear that. I wanted a cup of coffee and continue to talk about how the world has done me wrong. I couldn't look at me. I'd have the ability to look at me. But something shifted in June of 88 in the back of this abandoned building when God interrupted my death. He put me on a new course. I was on that course. I just didn't experience the things we get to, we get to experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. But what he left me with was being very teachable. So I asked, what do I do? When, how do you do the steps? And I was hungry. I knew I needed to be on your team. It was the last house on the block. And that desperation made me very, very teachable. Well, Big Book says alcohol beats us into a state of reasonable, reasonableness. It doesn't persuade me. It doesn't suggest. It beats me into a state of reasonableness. Now, when I was out there, I wasn't the toughest guy on the street. A few times I got beat up and it says, I quit. I'm done. You're killing me. And the guy would let go. That's what alcoholism did. I've had enough. And even with that, Six months later, I'm thinking I can have a drink just to take the edge off. That's the baffling feature of alcoholism. It doesn't care. And it'll take me back to that which is killing me. You know, I'll tell you, and this is for new folks, the most insane thing I'll ever do is from a place called sober. And that is go back to pick up a drink again. And if it isn't a drink, alcoholism will go underground and resurface in a sex spree 
a food spree, a gambling spree, a money spree, anything to make me feel okay, in control, I got it for now, take the heat off my back, but only to go deeper into it again, because I can't get out. I'm truly powerless over alcohol. And they kept talking to me about this God. I said, I can't see this God. I can't hear this God yet, but I was hungry. And what I've learned from a wise man who's passed on in the physical world, seeing is believing. In this world that we live in, believing is seeing. I believe that you believed. And so I chop wood and carry water and act as if for a long time. And I finally got a sponsor. And this sponsor, little by slowly, start walking me through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, our 12 steps. And we would make a lot of meetings together. He would, it was the get in the car days. He'd start picking you up in an hour. We're going to the Bronx for a meeting. We're going to Long Island for a meeting. Uh, we're going here and there for a meeting. And then I get there and I find out I'm the speaker. He would do that a lot. But it was like two or three or four guys in a car. There'd be a meeting in a car before the meeting, a meeting in the car after the meeting, and some fellowshipping in a diner. Um, I love Zoom, but we don't get to go to the diner afterwards. I miss that. And sometimes on Zoom, if we go, I bet you we go to page three and or two or three, there's only a few people with their faces on the screen. So I miss the in-person stuff. So that's what I was doing. And, um, you know, little by slowly, I start to get put back together again. And I don't know the day it was when I realized I haven't thought about drinking or hurting myself in a long time. I do remember one time crossing the street and a, and, and a, a, a police car was driving by with the siren on and I didn't freeze. For a long time when I would hear those sirens, I would freeze or the phone would ring and I would freeze. And I realized crossing the street, it's just a, a, a cop car going somewhere to help somebody and I'm not jumping uh, behind a bush somewhere to hide out. Little things like that, I experienced some freedom. Um but, you know, picking up a drink at 14 years old, I just want to talk about this and, and then get into a topic here. Um, I'm way beyond restless here and discontented at 14 years old. Those are nice uh, words. They sound good in our big book. But I bet the line goes around the block who would back me up and saying restless here and discontented are putting it mildly. I'm crawling out of my skin. I can't fit wherever I go. I'm always thinking. Do you ever be in a conversation with someone and as you're speaking, there's another voice saying, that was stupid. You shouldn't have said that. You, you don't look good. The jacket doesn't fit. Your hair's a mess. You look, sound stupid. I never went to college when I was around educated people. I want to hide out. Wherever I went, there I was. It was not good. And growing up, I was a gifted little musician. I was a good little athlete. I was good in school. And no matter how many trophies or accolades I would get, I was still looking at me in the mirror and it was not okay. And then I pick up alcohol and suddenly I'm okay. Everything was okay while I'm drunk and I want to stay drunk for eternity. I don't want to ever be sober again. And what could happen? And I've seen a lot of cats crash and burn with multiple years sober. Um, no spiritual muscles that were not working out in the AA gym and getting soul food every day. I start to get dry and, and sobriety without God gets very, very uncomfortable. I don't have anything to pour on my alcoholism. And I start to go way beyond rest of and discontented. I'm a raw nerve. Everything hurts. I'm critical. I'm judgmental. I'm character assassinating. If the world would do as I see fit, as Pete sees it, I'd be okay. That's an awful place to be. You know, in the third step, it says, relieve me of the bondage of self. I'm attached with an umbilical cord to this thing called self that does everything for me. And I have no, I have no input. I got to get unhooked from this self thing. Otherwise, I'm going through life and self is seeing, hearing, speaking, behaving. I got to get unhooked for that. And God was the remedy, quite frankly, there was a time in AA when he said, don't talk about God to a newcomer. You might scare him out. I don't agree with that. God forbid if I was sick and walked into the emergency room, I want the doctor to say, here's the medicine. It's going to hurt, but I'm giving it to you. I don't have to wait 90 days to give me the remedy. So the people I was put in front of were pretty much bulldogs and no-nonsense folks. They presented me with the big book. 
when I got to Alcoholics in 1988, guys, I got to tell you, I didn't have a clue about anything. I knew nothing about recovery. I didn't know who Bill and Bob was. Seven treatment centers. I don't know who Bill and Bob was. I know nothing about steps or a big book other than it's a good doorstop. I know nothing about traditions. I know nothing. Now, we live life forward and understand that backwards it was a blessing. Because I think looking back at how I would operate back then, if I had some information, I would have used that as a weapon. If I was about to map out my, my life for the last almost 36 years now, I would have made a mess of it. I knew nothing, and God kept it that way. In 1988, in the back of this hallway, when my surrender came, uh, I wasn't thinking, well, I need to go to a detox, then I'll go to a treatment center, then I'll go to AA, and then I'll go to the steps, and by Monday, I'll be Moses. Um, I didn't know what to do. My only, the only thing that came out of my mouth was that that very same God who I despise so much was, please take me from this, I don't want to die. I don't know where I was going to go after that. My family had basically closed doors on me. There was there was no girlfriends to run to. There was no job I can get you on Monday to get some money. There was no home to go to. I'm living in the back of an abandoned building in Alphabet City in Lower Manhattan, a very sordid spot back then. It's just me and this God. So today where God has uh, 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 this conversion that has happened, I, 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 I have an intimate relationship with God. And, and part, of, part of my job here is to shout his name from the rooftops and not apologize for it. If I stop talking about what I believe in, I will stop believing in it. If I stop doing what you guys have taught me, what begins to happen, self takes over, this mind starts to run a show on me again. And little by slowly, I start to get away from you. Even though I'm at a meeting, I'm starting to get away from you. And I start to isolate. And that brings pain and suffering. And that brings more isolation. And I'm consumed with me all day long. And my thought life is creating my current reality. And when I'm like that, I forfeit every invitation that God is sending to me to do work for him, to go help some. I can't hear it because I'm consumed with me. Conversely, when I'm in the middle of you guys and I'm praying and meditating and calling a sponsor and getting to meetings and doing step work, not for the mechanics, not to show up like an AA mechanic and recite the big book. I've been there, done that. It's about the conversion that's happened. What does it look like live? Well, don't ask me. You can ask my friends. You can ask my wife. You can ask my sponsor. Go to my home group. They'll report to you clearly how I am, the people I work with. There was a time where I would never call a meeting like that. Today, I'm open to you calling a meeting like that. And I'm far from perfect, but God is. My family was torn apart by what? I did to them and what alcoholism did to me. And in 1988, none of us were on speaking terms. In fact, the only guy who would come get me would be my dad. And so little by solely, God gave it kind of went to our neutral corners. And then uh, uh, he put us back together little by slowly. And um, uh, that family that was riddled by alcoholism uh, was put back together. My, my brothers found uh, Al-Anon. My brothers found uh, therapy. My brothers found church. And I was brought to you. Desperate. And you guys fed me, little by slowly, this information. I, 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 I can't, I, I'm, I speak for myself, I can't say, you know, when I get an anniversary coin, how hard I've worked for my recovery, because that would be a lie. Quite frankly, I've done little or nothing. God gave me desperation. God gave me you. You gave me information, and I followed it. And I'm here. For me, this whole AA walk, Alcoholics Anonymous, makes no sense. I mean, Saturday morning at 1030, I put on a sport jacket and a clean shirt to talk. Um, I love the name of the group, The Morning After, because usually The Morning After, I can't recall the night before. 
the only thing I remember is meeting someone who looked like Bo Derek and waking up next to Bo Diddley. That's about as good as I can do back then. Um, the morning after, please. But here we are, you know, uh, uh, full of life and sobriety. There's a couple of folks out here who are really new. And I can tell you, from my own experience, we want to tell the members in AA, I got 10 days or 30 days, I'm, I'm so grateful I'm doing great. You're not. We know that. You're doing better. But we know what 10 days and 30 days and 60 days feels like. And the best thing we can do, and I was taught this, is I'm sober 30 days, I'm so grateful to be here, but I'm messy. We get that. We totally get that because every one of us have been messy, if I can be so bold as to say that. And maybe with 10 years, you might be messy again. So we get that. But what I can tell you is pay no attention to the thinking and the narratives in the head. They're all lies. Delusions of grandeur, or I don't have a chance at this. Got to cover a million different things today rather than maybe getting some quiet time with God and my sponsor and get to a meeting. Good day, meeting. Bad day, meeting. In between, get to a meeting. Because the information that people are talking about, no one there will ever hurt us in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's an old one. Women stay with the women and men stay with the guys. No cross-pollination here. We, uh, we stay with each other. And the woman, I got it, you know, you guys still do it. Uh, you guys are better at protecting your own than the guys are. A new girl would come in, new woman would come in, and uh, the ladies would circle around her uh, to make sure she was safe and protected. I've watched a woman, one woman is speaking, and there's three cars of, of girls going to watch her speak. You got, You guys really got it locked down. But we get to meetings and we get a sponsor and, and the mind is going to be tricky at the beginning. There's a lot of mood swings and things like that. Um, if we get involved with our big book and the 12 steps, and all three sides of a triangle, that has been a successful remedy for me. Little by slowly, it's not my time. It's in God's time. You know, what I fell into was I, I, I go to God, please get me sober. And I get sober and I'm getting um, a little restless, ill, and discontented. I'm looking elsewhere for contentment rather than the same power that got me sober. I can fall into that. I need to be mindful of, you know, my being guided by God or the part of me that thinks it's God. I know what I need to do. And so as as we I wrap up here, because I got about seven minutes, I guess I spent a few minutes on a topic. And um, what is important to me now was it important to me then is having a sponsor. I can't use my mind to sponsor me because um, that's not the part of me that's creating the problem is not where I go to, to solve the problem. I need I need a sponsor who can sift through a lot of my stuff besides walking me through the 12 steps and teaching me about our fellowship and all the things that sponsors do. I have someone I can, I can have a conversation with about where I am in my life, what's going on in my head, my fears and my concerns, my hopes and my dreams, and how to take a commitment at my home group. This is important to me. Uh, my first sponsor um, was a guy named Tony back in Brooklyn, although everyone in Brooklyn's named Tony. Um, at my at my house on Christmas, when you say, hello, Tony, 45 guys turn around. I mean, it's just, just the way it is. Um, but uh, his name was Tony, and, you know, he wasn't very popular or, or liked um, back in Brooklyn because he was one of the few guys who walked around with the big book and talked about the solution he found in the big book and the God he found as a result of the 12 steps. And it's interesting, the God we find as a result of the 12 steps is was always there. We just kind of wake up to it. It's the aha moment. Oh, my God, it's God. He never left me. And I was with this this person, this man, for about eight years. Uh, he was a great sponsor, uh, took me through the traditions and showed me the importance of home group. And I shared inventory with him and a lot of life stuff with him. And he shared his experience, strength, and hope. 
But like all of us, he had clay feet and started to get away from what was working for him. And I prayed to God again. I need a new teacher. And perhaps the greatest teacher I, I've ever had in my life up until this point uh, uh, was this guy named Mark H. from Texas. And Mark H. Uh, uh, just completely turned me inside out. I, 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 I look back on the lessons he gave me and the walk was his sermon and how disciplined he was and yet open and how much he loved this God. And he taught me a whole bunch about this walk that I'm involved in. And I met my grand sponsor through him and, and that kind of lineage. It was just incredible. And um, Mark kept taking me through the steps once a year and asked me how I was doing in service. And it was important that I had a service commitment. I learned about that. No expert at it. But I learned about the importance of it and contributing and giving back. I can't be a taker anymore. And I had a couple of sponsors after after Mark Pitt passed away. And um, I currently have Bob Bazans, who's just, uh, he's a teacher. He's an elder. We have conversations, sometimes short. Uh, this past week it was a long one about some things I'm up against. When life gets a little heavier, usually in my own way. But the importance of sponsorships and, and, and sponsors and what a, what a lot of these uh, guys did for me was uh, kind of open up the world of AA for me other than my neighborhood of AA and getting me to see different parts of, uh, of this, uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous in different places. And I got to experience that a whole bunch. So from six months till right now, I've never been without a sponsor. Perhaps I'm not as dependent upon a sponsor as I was when I was new, because when you knew it's a healthy dependence on a sponsor, understanding they're a human power. But we started to evolve a little bit, and that, that's been happening to me. There was a, a time in my life I was very, very, and I don't regret it, very attached to mechanics uh, and methodology, and I let you know about it. Um, but it was the course that God put me on to keep me disciplined, and, and the mechanics are still important to me. Uh, the discipline is still important to me. Um, I'm in a place where um, it's about being open uh, and having conversations and, and talking to another drunk and to other folks. There's three places I'm most comfortable. My sponsor always says he's better around us. I totally identify with that. You know, I would see a friendly face like Ron White out there, and I say, okay, I got some home cooking here. This is good. I, 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 him and his brother, I, I adore. Um, I'm better around you guys. I just am. The other place I'm most comfortable is when I'm with my wife. I'm just better with her. I can, my sponsors, I can open up my top button, if you will, and kick back. And the other place I'm most comfortable, and that's in my church. It's three, those three places make everything make sense to me. The nutty world we're all living in right now, it's, it's, it's off the rails right now. AA, when I'm with my, my wife and, and I'm church and in church, it makes sense to me. Everything just comes together. But I'm with you more often than anything. And I'm grateful for how you feed me every time I walk into a meeting called Alcoholics Anonymous. So I guess the topic, I, I, I hope it, it works, is do I have a sponsor? Um, or is it a name only? What does that relationship look like? What am I doing with my sponsor? And there's different flavors. You know, some people like the boot camp sponsor. Others like a little lighter touch. Everyone's got a different flavor. I like strawberry ice cream. My wife can't even look at it. You know, so it, it's kind of like it's just different flavors. But we're all going up the same hill together, and we're going to arrive at the same place. I think the planet has forgot that part. We haven't in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I think that's all I got, man. Thanks for listening. Peace. Peace. 
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.